uh, James Cook University and then expert in typology and Papian languages and the various other things. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to be discussing to a um, perhaps chair of uh, the talk with this, uh, this wonderful series uh, known as Abraling Au Vivo, Linguists Online, which is a really a very impressive initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association, Abralin, and is designed to give students and researchers free access to real state-of-the-art discussions on the most diverse topics related to the study of human language, especially important in these powerless times when we don't really travel. Uh, now, uh, we are really honored this time. Uh, we will have a talk by uh, Dr. Hanna Sarvasi, who is a real uh, star of uh, modern linguistics. The title of the talk is Beyond the Two Clause Sentence, Acquisition and Processing of Clause Chains. Hanna is uh, one of the most amazing young scholars in the world, I think, in my experience. She is a major expert on Papuan languages of Morobe province and Papua New Guinea, and also Berber, Banto, Atlantic, and counting. Her field of general expertise lies in the study of the phenomenon of switch reference clause chaining across the world's languages and their acquisition by children. She has published a, a very impressive grammar of Nungan, the Papuan language, of Morobe province and assembled their huge corpus of child language acquisition materials for Nungan, this Papuan language. And that was the first Pacific language to enter the international child language database, Childis. So over to Hannah, and I'm sure we'll enjoy it. Uh, well, I, we're greatly looking forward to the scintillating talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sasha. All right, I'm going to talk today about an under-investigated sentence type called the clause chain and present new data to you on acquisition and processing of clause chains. Usually we complete or approach completion of cross-linguistic typological analysis of any linguistic category before people venture into study of acquisition and psycholinguistics of this category. But a secondary goal of my talk is to explore with you whether we can actually pursue basic typology alongside acquisition and psycholinguistics with advances in each area complementing the other two. In hundreds of languages around the world, speakers have the option of describing sequentially related events, states, and actions through a series of adjacent clauses with verbal predicates that are underspecified for tense and often other categories combined either in the beginning or at the very end with a single clause that has a fully specified verbal predicate. And this sequence is called a clause chain. Now, those underspecified verbs that make up the bulk of the chain are generally called medial verbs, and the clauses in which they occur can be referred to as medial clauses. For the majority of clause chaining languages, that last fully specified verb that has full tense marking occurs at the end of the chain, and we can call this a final verb, especially for those languages, and the clause in which it occurs, a final clause. This is the terminology I'll be using here. If we were to get a flavor of this in English for English speakers, we might, it might be best to try to mimic verb final constituent order, which is the case in the majority of clause chaining languages of this, of this type. We can say something like this, waking, dressing, breakfast making, I outside went. Now, clause chains may occur in something around a thousand languages around the world, including Brazil. But despite this geographic spread, there's no published comprehensive typology. That is, there's no published comprehensive analysis of how clause chains differ or are similar from uh, Tibetan to languages of Papua New Guinea to languages of the Amazon. There's no such volume or no such work at the moment. Clause have a number of special characteristics. I'll touch on six of them. First, probably best discussed in the literature, is that the syntactic relationship between clauses in clause chains is neither textbook subordination, 
where one clause serves as an argument in or complement of another clause, nor textbook coordination in which two equal status clauses are linked with a conjunction. Rather, medial clauses are dependent, but they're not embedded. And so clause chains served as the impetus for the coinage co-subordination. Um, clause chains have also been called more recently, uh, uh, they've been referred to as a type of asymmetrical coordination. A second interesting characteristic, clause chains represent a multi-clause syntactic unit that the grammar demarcates through verb morphology. That is, you have medial verb, medial verb, medial verb, medial verb. When you get to the final verb in a clause chain, it's like a morphological punctuation mark that announces morphologically through the verb morphology that some sort of unit has ended. In a very short clause chain of two, three clauses, this looks like a good counterpart to a sentence in English or Portuguese. But when you have a very long clause chain of 20 clauses, then as Robert Longacre first remarked in the 80s, uh, this looks a lot like a paragraph. In any case, there's some sort of unit that the grammar is marking through morphology with a clause chain. In many languages though, you also get prosodically, prosodic mark, uh, marking of a clause chain with rising or flat intonation at the ends of medial clauses, but a fall on the final clause. And here's a pitch trace for a five clause chain in the uh, language Nuon of Papua New Guinea, from which I'll be drawing an, an, a, a lot of data for this talk. You have a fall in the final clause. So you have both, in many languages, both prosodic demarcation and morphological demarf demarcation of this multi clause syntactic unit that's greater uh, than, at, at, that's minimally two clauses. Third point, in some clause chaining languages, switch reference marking indicates whether the subject of the upcoming clause that hasn't yet been spoken by the speaker would be the same as that of the currently articulated clause. So I'll use the abbreviations in this talk SS for same subject. This means that in clause A, the subject of clause A is going to be the same as clause B. Different subject DS, subject of clause B will differ from clause A. And clause A is the one that's being spoken when SS or DS marking is produced. If we were to approximate this in English, we might say something like this. I walking, same subject. I can have a pause, but you already know as the listener that I will continue to be the subject of the next clause, whatever that may be. Friend seeing, different subject. We know from the previous clause that the subject here is I, we don't have to repeat it. But when we see that different subject marker here, we know that I will no longer be the subject in the next clause. And indeed we get she waving, different subject. She's the subject now, but in the next clause it won't be. And finally, we parted. The switch reference marking requires a speaker to commit while still articulating clause A to the identity of the subject of the next as yet unspoken clause B. And this could mean, at least in my experience as a non-native speaker of the Papua language new one, clause chaining language, this seems that people are doing something different when they plan clause chains with switch reference marking. Perhaps they have to plan farther ahead than speakers of many Western European languages do with similar constructions. Here's an example of a clause chain, including switch reference marking from a text message in Nuon I received in November. Now here and elsewhere are used to connect the conventions of two, a single curly bracket for medial clause boundaries, double, medial, double curly uh, bracket for final clause boundaries, and single square bracket for subordinate clauses, which in new one are always final clauses with full tense marking. Sister, as for the question that I put down first, you understanding it, it being good, then good, my husband and I taking our money, then good, you all putting it, could it go into our new account? So there are four points that I want to make about this example. First, um, in the first medial clause, there's also, within that medial clause, there's a subordinated final clause. So medial clauses can themselves be complex. This one includes a relative clause. The question that I put down first is all within that medial clause. The second point that I want to make is that throughout this 
clause chain, all the four medial, medial verbs are inflected for different subject marking. And this very strictly follows grammatical subjects in Nuun and in this example. So in the second medial clause, orgoina, it being good, different subject, the subject is not animate and it's rather abstract, the question, the question being good, but despite being inanimate and somewhat abstract, it still triggers different subject marking. It's part of the switch reference marking system. It still triggers that marking on the preceding medial verb. The third point that I want to make is that this entire clause chain is framed in the counterfactual modality and the interrogative mood. But you only find this out in the very last two words, the inflected final verb go, ongoon, and the polar question marker ha, ongoon ha. This comes at the very end. And remember, this is written, this is a text message. If the, ten, if the inflection of the verb go at the very end were different, if it were, for instance, in the remote past tense, then this entire clause chain would have to be understood as framed in the remote past tense and about things that happened in the past. Sister, did all of this happen or not, would be the meaning. And if that interrogative marker, ha, were removed, and it were in the remote past, then the entire thing would be understood as a statement about what happened in the remote past. These are very different things. And so a major question with clause chains is, when you have all of that key information only at the very end of a chain that could be quite long and involved, what are listeners doing mentally? What kind of pictures are they forming of the events that are being discussed? When do they start anticipating that this is all counterfactual or this is all going to be a question? These are at the moment still open questions. So what we've seen so far is clause chains are special because of this syntactic relationship between clauses, the morphological indication of this multi-clause unit, maybe a sentence, maybe a paragraph, but the equivalent of which is not necessarily morphologically indicated in many other languages. This inflectional indication of tense and other categories only in the very last clause, so the potential for much ambiguity before that. And that switch reference marking in many clause changing languages forces speakers to commit in advance to the identity of the subject of the following clause. Now, there are two more points of interest I also want to share with you. First, clause chains can be extremely long measured in clauses. Clancy 2020 describes a story in one chain strategy used occasionally in Japanese, which resulted in a 20 clause chain recorded from a three-year-old child. The entire story was told as a single clause chain. This strategy has also been reported for other languages. So uh, 137 clause chain described uh, for the language Aguaruna of Peru. The potential for such extreme length is one factor. It seems distinguishing clause chains from similar constructions. So an adverbial clause unspecified for tense plus a main clause specified for tense in languages like English. And last, clause chains have an underlying uh, basic semantic function. They can have extended functions and in many clause chaining languages they do, but their basic semantic function across languages seems to be to describe sequentially related events, states, and actions, sequences of occurrences. There's evidence, at least for some languages, that clause chains are used extensively in narratives and other tense iconically organized discourse. Well, tense iconically, I really mean just uh, sequences of uh, happenings where the thing that happened first is told first and the thing that happened next is told next. But there's evidence that clause chains do not occur as extensively, for instance, in ruminations on a theme or thematically organized discourse. Now, I took a sample of 49 Nguyen narratives that I had recorded during the course of grammatical research by 18 speakers, nine men, nine women. In these texts, there are 1,742 clause chains and the distribution is striking. So here's a chart. This shows the length of the text, the duration of that narrative, how long it took someone to tell the narrative on the bottom. And on the y-axis, you have number of clause chains per text. And you can see that as a text becomes longer in Nguyen for these speakers, the number of clause chains in that text increases very consistently, almost linearly 
to the point that we can predict if we had a text of 500 seconds in length, that it would have between 50 and 130 clause chains in new one. There's very predictable and consistent distribution of clause chains in new one narratives. Now here's a visual. This is a free narrative text that a child in the new one area who was in grade three, which means they could be about um, eight or nine or even 10 years old, wrote in the new one language. It's a narrative. It's called A Man Named Peta. Now I've gone ahead and circled medial clauses here, circled medial verbs. The medial verbs are in blue and final verbs are circled in red. So you can see that this section, this image from the beginning of this text is full of medial verbs with a few final verbs. And in fact, this narrative text is a sequence of clause chains with no other sentence types in this portion that's, in, that's uh, pictured here. So there's an 11 clause chain, followed by a three clause chain, followed by a two clause chain, and then followed by a very long clause chain that of which 24 clauses are visible and which continues below. Now contrast this visual with an image of a different sort of discourse. This is a, a, a slightly older child in grade eight who wrote an essay on whether the new one language, which again is spoken by only about a thousand people, will survive into the future. The title is, the new one language will finish, it won't survive. Now here again, I've circled final verbs with red. I've circled other verb swarms with green. These are nominalizations, etc. And there are no medial verbs in the first paragraph and a half. There are no clause chains in the first paragraph and a half of this essay. Why? Well, there could be various reasons this child has a little more formal education, but the main reason is that the discourse is organized differently. It's organized thematically, discussion of the merits or dismerits of or demerits of the new language and not um, relating of a sequence of events and action. So this partial predictability of clause chain distribution in new one, based on discourse organization, contrasts with the distribution of complex sentence types such as coordination versus subordination in non-clause chaining languages like English, where they've been shown not to correlate with discourse organization. So this is a summary of these six points that we've seen for why clause chains are special. Yet, as I said, closed chains have been rather, um, have, have not received their due attention by typologists. And there's no comprehensive analysis across languages as to what a clause chain is. What, what is the kernel of clause chain hood that persists across languages around the world? And that's what we're working on now. The overarching questions here for typologists are, first, what are the parameters for variation across languages in clause chain structure, semantics, and use? And second, how to distinguish between clause chains and similar constructions that have that verb lacking tense followed uh, combined with a verb that also that has tense, adverbial plus main cause constructions, for instance. And further, how to distinguish between clause chaining languages, languages in which clause chains, as you saw in, in new one, are consistently distributed, ubiquitous in certain uh, discourse genres, and very natural, and non-clause chaining languages where this is not the case. For instance, one can approximate a five clause chain in English, as I tried to do earlier, but it's unnatural, and it would be very unusual for English speakers to do so. Traditional ways to tackle these questions really involve literature review. Well, they involve some fieldwork, perhaps, and lots of research into grammars and articles, and some philosophizing, some hard thinking about what makes sense. Now, not only have clause chains garnered less than I would argue their fair share of attention in typological circles, but there's been a resultant near total absence of research into clause chain acquisition by children or by adults and processing, that is their psycholinguistics. This makes sense because typological research traditional feeds acquisition research. And it's hard to find examples as Slobin and Bowerman noted before of acquisition really moving the, forward of the, the, the field of typology forward and similarly for psycholinguistic research. But a question I'd like to explore in this talk is whether we can indeed leverage acquisition research 
for insights into typology and whether we can leverage psycholinguistic research for insights into typology before the typology of a category has really been cemented as with clause chains. So I'll begin with discussing some new data from our work on acquisition of clause chaining. There are a number of open questions. At the beginning of our research, we've uh, given some answers to some, but there's still much to be done. When do children start to produce clause chains? When do they start to comprehend clause chains? How long are their clause chain productions? How frequently do clause chains occur in the speech they're hearing from their parents? For languages with multiple clause chain semantic types, are these acquired at different stages? How do the frequency and acquisition ages for children's clause chain productions relate to those for their other complex sentence types? And what about switch reference marking? So I'll deal with some of these in red here. Now the sources for my discussion today come from the papers in a Frontiers in Psychology research topic on the acquisition of clause chaining that I did with, I edited with Sun Jia Choi this past year. We had 10 contributions and of those six are really for uh, clause chaining languages, languages where this structure is widespread and natural. Of those three are Eurasian languages with millions of speakers, Japanese, Korean, and Turkish. And three are languages of the Pacific, Papua New Guinea for Kuwaru and Nuon, and Australia for Pichantiara, with many fewer speakers, fewer than 5,000 speakers. And something that I'll return to later is that we also had three other contributions for comparative purposes, similar constructions in non clause chaining languages, Hebrew to Mayan languages, and Sesotho. Here's an example of a clause chain from the paper on Japanese. At first swings in a slide being there, neither Yukiko nor anybody being there, now Yukiko and Sachiko having balloons, bringing their mothers, now Sachiko riding on the swing, Yukiko going on the slide, letting her balloon fly off, Sachiko giving Yukiko the balloon she's holding, exchanging it for her hat, then I don't know whether they went home with their mothers, but they left. This clause chain was produced by a child of seven years, three months. And you can see that the convention here with child language acquisition is to have the year followed by a semicolon, followed by the months for a child's age. Here are all the medial clauses I've marked in blue, and you'll note that they have an unchanging suffix te on them. And that unlike in new one, te can either be followed by the same subject as in clause A or a different subject in Japanese. Now, one of the contributions of our research topic is, let's say, broadening the field of, uh, broadening, increasing the diversity of the data that child language acquisition research draws on. I'd like to remind you that the 600 to 800 languages of Papua New Guinea represent over 10% of the world's languages, about 6,000. And of those, approximately 400 to 500 languages involve clause chaining, but we have very, very little uh, uh, published research on acquisition of any languages of Papua New Guinea, let alone clause chaining. And so our volume contributed to many languages of Papua New Guinea are spoken in very remote places that are hard to access. This is an image from the access of the access point for the Nuon area where I work. This is the airstrip that was carved by local people using hand tools over a number of years out of the mountainside to provide access for outsiders. Now, my particular contribution to this research topic is on the Nuon language. There's a thousand speakers of Nuon, but this is across four dialects. So really there are no more than about 300 speakers of any one dialect of Nuon. And my work all, uh, draws on the Toet dialect. People live a uh, traditional lifestyle. Papua New Guinea is one of the, the world's seats of agriculture and people are expert farmers. There's no electricity in the area. If you're interested in more, you can look at my grammar as Sasha mentioned. Now, for our new one child caregiver interaction corpus, there are two components. There's one larger component that involves five children, but this is not as dense. They're recorded for one hour monthly. And of course, the criticism of this sort of research is that you can miss a lot of language if that's all you're sampling. We then added 60 hours from three children who recorded for four hours in one week monthly, which is sort of the, um, the, the consensus um, amount. And this new one data combined with Kuwaru and these other languages gives us a picture of clause chain acquisition, at least for these languages. When do children start producing clause chains? Well, their first two clause chains occur somewhere between at the earliest one year, nine months, and at the latest 
two years, nine months. And you see the biggest spread actually for the Papuan language Kuwaru here. Now this age range, so just before the age of two, all the way up past two and a half, is similar to when we know that children start producing complex sentences, subordination and coordination, in Western European languages that have been much more widely studied, such as English and French. And for those languages, Holger Diesel and colleagues have analyzed the progression, the development for children as having at least two stages. And the early stage of children's subordination in English is described by Diesel and colleagues as essentially being one proposition expressed as two clauses. So here you have two children, Nina, famous Nina and Adam, that's doggy turn around. Now, Diesel and colleagues analyze this as essentially a single proposition. The dog is turning around expressed as formally two clauses. In later stages, then children in these corpora um, express two propositions and two clauses. I want to go to the zoo that has those animals. I want to go to the zoo. The zoo has animals. Two propositions. And early coordination is also analyzed as being somewhat faulty in languages like English, where you often have simple juxtaposition without a conjunction, hit ball, get it. And then later, the addition of a conjunction. You push it and it goes up. In contrast, we didn't find this sort of progression with clause chains. In general, across the languages we looked at, the earliest clause chains are semantically complex. So not just representing a single proposition across two clauses. There are a few scattered exceptions in, our, in our, the works we looked at, but this is the generalization. And morphologically error-free, so they're not missing conjunctive elements. So here's an example from a new one speaking child of age two years, five months. Cooking sweet potatoes, let me go on the airplane. This is clearly not something that she's memorized uh, by rote. She's producing it, it's creative, it's productive. It's not lacking any morphology and it contains two propositions. What about the length of children's clause chains? Are they doing this 20, 30, 137 clause production at age two? No. We stumbled upon something that seems to be a major discovery for language acquisition, and it's, it's, it makes sense, but nobody had thought to look into it, which is that children's clause chains, and we would argue children's complex sentences in perhaps any language, begin in a two-clause phase. We know that children learning many languages start out uh, in, in the early stages of acquisition they go through a stage where they produce utterances that comprise only two words. And what we've found here is that children's earliest clause chains comprise two clauses. And after this stage, which may last for just a month or it may last for a number of months, children's productions expand. And this is generally not to three and then to four and then to five, but they expand as with the two word stage, which then goes to a more stage. We have a two clause phase followed by a more clause phase, where children are now producing three to five clause chains in that month when they expand from two clauses. Why was this unknown up to now? Well, it seems that no one thought to investigate when children learning English or Portuguese begin to combine three or more clauses in a single sentence, because it's not as relevant for those languages. It's not uh, as, as um, as obvious, let's say, as with clause chaining languages, that this is something you would want to look into. Now, what about switch reference marking in child productions? So remember that switch reference marking forces speakers to plan the subject of their next clause before finishing the present clause that they're speaking. And this would seem to be a challenge. It's a challenge for me as a non-native speaker, so perhaps it's a challenge for children, perhaps not. Now here's an example of the, I hope that this will illustrate the magnitude of the planning task that people have when they're producing switch reference marking as native speakers of these languages. It's not uncommon for new one speaking parents to lead their children through narrative retellings, one clause at a time. This is in itself uh, interesting because it says that the clause is somehow a salient unit for native speakers who have not necessarily studied the grammar of their language. So if a child gets stuck in one of these sessions, the parent may jump in and say, let's talk about the time that we did X 
and if the child is still silent, then the parent may say, may begin to tell the story and have the child repeat clause by clause. So here the mother says, him tong I tok, she was being sick. The child repeats it, him tong I tok, she was being same subject sick. Him yuna, says the mother, she becoming different subject sick. Child says she turning different subject sick. Mother says her mother cooked it. Child says her mother cooked it. She cooked a chicken, she cooked a chicken. She cooking different subject a chicken, says the mother. She cooking different subject. Mother, it having roasted different subject completely. Child, it having roasted different subject completely. So what I'm trying to show you here is that the mother has in her mind the relationship between two clauses to such, a, uh, to, to such an advanced degree that she's able to uh, produce different subject marking, comply with the marking that she used after the child has already um, spoken and there's been a perhaps significant pause in, before her next clause. You don't see mistakes here. You don't see the mother saying, oh, I forget what subject I said I was going to do. Let me start over. And of course, it's possible that you do see these, but um, not, in this, not in this sample. So I suggested in my, in my contribution to our research topic that switch reference marking systems might put extra cognitive demands on speakers. And so small children might use one of these three strategies. We might see these. Either they avoid clause chain use in languages that require switch reference marking, so they don't have to commit in advance to what the subject is going to be next and use other complex sentence types instead. So we might see uh, children doing a lot of coordination of final clauses and not clause chains in the early stages of language acquisition. We might see them use only same subject clause chains so they can just assume that the subject continues and don't have to deal with the possibility of change. Or we might see morphological reduction where they just wipe out the, the, the suffixes that talk about switch reference markings so they don't have to deal with them. So let's see what happens. Now, first, in those six languages that we studied, there are two languages, Kuwaru Nuon, the two of Papua New Guinea, in which switch reference is obligatorily marked through medial verb morphology in clause chains. In Pityantiara of Australia, it's optionally marked, but with a standalone particle, and this is optional. And in Japanese, Korean, and Turkish, certain medial verb forms in clause chains are associated, but as we saw with Japanese te, perhaps somewhat loosely, with subject maintenance and others are associated with subject difference or some are associated with either. You could do either with that particular form. Now, what we found looking into when children produce their first clause chains with a different subject across clauses, we found that for the language for which data are extant, there's a lot of difference. Korean children produce clause chains that have different subjects in the two clauses from the very beginning, before two years of age. One new one speaking child produced her first same subject clauses at two, age, two years, four months, and then her different first different subject clauses at two years, five months. So not much of a difference there. But in Kuwaru and Pityantiara, there's a significant lag. Children start making their clause chains around two years, a bit after two and a half, but their first different subject clause chains aren't until four years or four and a half. So what is going on here? Are these children using that strategy B that I proposed? Are they, are they shying from different subject clause chains because of the difficulty and sticking to same subject clause chains? Well, it seems that if they are doing this, it's not because of cognitive constraints, it's not a learning strategy, but in fact, it very clearly reflects what their parents are doing in conversation with them. So if we look at the percentage of same subject clauses and clause chains in the parental speech per recording session, for Kuwaru, 100% in almost half of the recording sessions of parental clause chains are same subject only, no different subject marking at all in the parents' clause chains. And it's always greater than 97%. In Pityandiara, it's 100% in almost the entire corpus for parents, same subject clause chains. In new one, in contrast, it ranges from 60 to 80%, varying by parent and recording session, but it's never 100%. There's always different subject clause chains in parental speech, 
Now, the last area we'll look at in acquisition concerns how children's clause chains relate to their coordinate sentences and subordinate sentences. Here's one of the two children that were studied learning new one at this age. Child T.O. Her earliest clause, her earliest complex sentences are clause chains, but she doesn't produce many of them. And this kind of goes along and goes along and goes along from 28 months up to 35 months. At 35 months, she also produces her first coordinated final clauses, but there's not many tokens per recording session. At 36 months of age, so three years, she has a leap. She has a leap in her clause chains and a slight leap in her coordinated final clauses. But from there onward, she has exponential growth in number of clause chains and much more gradual growth in subordinated final clause and coordinated final clauses. So this is a very striking difference. And it's upheld by the other child who studied in this age range, NN. So his clause chains and coordinated final clauses go along not very many tokens per session through age three. At three years, one month, he has that marked increase in clause chains and a slight increase in the other sentence types. And for the rest of his study period, he continues to have many, many more clause chains than the other complex sentence types. So what we've seen in terms of acquisition of clause chains can be summarized as follows. So we've seen that there's a two clause phase and this universally precedes a three or three to five clause phase. And my challenge to those of you out there who do acquisition research is um, to ask whether this could in fact be a universal characteristic across languages, not just in clause chaining languages. Do all children go through such a phase or is this just irrelevant for children learning English or French or Portuguese? Now, the age of the first use of different subject marking in clause chains relates transparently to distributions in adult speech. So it doesn't necessarily uh, show any cognitive constraints. In new one, the two children studied show little use of any complex sentence types, subordination, coordination, or clause chaining until just before age three. And then clause chain use increases exponentially while coordinated and subordinated final clauses increase much more gradually. And it remains to be seen whether this holds for other clause chaining languages. Now, comparing this to what's known or what's had been reported and analyzed for English and French early complex sentences, we've seen these own colleagues analyzing the progression for children acquiring English as going from one proposition in two clauses to two propositions in two clauses. And for coordination, simple juxtaposition to use of conjunctions. Well, for children acquiring clause chains, they generally progress from two propositions in two clauses to three or more propositions in three or more clauses. And there's no morphological or syntactic lack that could be comparable to the, the absence of conjunctions in early English coordination. Now I'm going to move to processing and psycholinguistics, and then I'll conclude. Now for processing, I'm going to present the results. Well, I'm going to present two experiments to you and a bit of results. Most of the results are, the analyses are still being finalized now. Some of the questions we wanted to address in these experiments are how far ahead speakers plan their clause chains. Again, harking back to this paper by uh, Polly and Snyder that said that uh, perhaps people plan one clause at a time in all languages. Are switch reference markers interpreted by listeners as clues to upcoming subject identity or how do they interpret them? And do listening to and producing long clause chains entail greater cognitive load than other sentence types? A very interesting question that's not addressed in these experiments is how do listeners deal with those ambiguities that build up an ambiguity in tense or mood or other things before hearing the final verb? So that remains an open question. So the first experiment that we did was an eye tracking experiment. Why use eye tracking? Well, the eyes move to seek out visual information, it said three to four times a second, and this movement is often unconscious. So since we have this conscious or unconscious movement that relates to time, we can sync it to the timing of linguistic phenomena and examine how they match 
We used a visual world paradigm here, which involves the display of images in different parts of a screen for people to look at while they're being eye tracked. But we were aware that this sort of, this paradigm could be very challenging for clause chains. How can you represent a single actor doing multiple actions sequentially for people who are not familiar necessarily with comic book reading conventions and this sort of thing? But there's switch reference. So the question we were asking writ large is essentially, does switch reference marking constrain visual reference search? Here's an image of what this sort of setup looked like. So we ran this in the new one area. Everything was solar powered. Again, there's no electricity there. And we got 68 people to participate. And here's my project manager running a participant through the clause chain perception block. The comprehension or perception block involved 15 clause chains that we took from the new one adult monologues corpus. And as people listened to these, they saw one of 15 corresponding screens. Each of these had two to, find, uh, two to five hand-drawn images that corresponded to the grammatical subjects in that clause chain they were hearing. Then there was a production block where they were then fitted with a microphone and they were told that they would see the same 15 screen displays, but now they would say something about those displays. So they could either tell a story about them or describe them. And I'll show some examples from the comprehension data here. Here's an example of one of those images they saw. And this clause chain was an excerpt from a new one language retelling of the biblical plague story. So here we have a bunch of frogs and a man. The frogs are on top of a house and covering a tree, etc. Now in new one, what the stimulus said was frogs coming same subject. That tells you the frogs are going to be the subject in the next clause. The area here covering up fully doing different subject. So still it's the frogs doing that covering, but different subject. They won't be the subject in the next clause. Then addressing him or her, she or he followed him or her. I say him or her because it's just third person singular marking there. Now, in this chart, we can see the proportions of fixations across 61 participants who are combined here. And the blue line represents looks to the frogs and the red line represents looks to the man. So we can see at the beginning of this chart, at time zero, a little less than 70% of participants are looking at the frogs and a bit more than 30% are looking at the man. And this changes slightly as time goes on as they listen to the stimulus. The green rectangle indicates the time in which the same subject marker, frogs coming same subject, was heard. And you can see that in that time period, people cemented their preference for the frogs and developed even more of a dispreference for the man. So they continue to look at the frogs or they switch to looking at the frogs during this time period. Now the red rectangle indicates the different subject marker on covering up fully doing different subject, where the grammar says, now we're going to switch away from frogs as a subject. And here we saw a steep drop in proportion of people who were looking at the frogs and increase in looking at the man. Now, if we plug this into a statistical model, we find that indeed there's a significant difference between where people looked after they heard a same subject marker and where they looked after they heard a different subject marker. This was significant. So we can say that these results, these preliminary result results that I'm sharing with you do imply that listeners do indeed seem to use switch reference markers as cues to expect a same or different actor in the next clause. Now, the second experiment I'm going to share with you, analysis is still fully in progress, so I won't share any preliminary results, but I'll explain to you what we did. So here we used EEG. Now, EEG involves the placement of electrodes along the scalp to measure brain electrical activity while somebody's sitting very still and being passively exposed to visual or auditory linguistic stimuli. And from these results, we can look for certain ERPs or event-related potentials. We want to look for certain uh, signposts in the signal that tell us that there's uh, positive or negative peaks or anterior negativity, that they're doing something uh, different. Um, their, their brain is jolted by the ungrammaticality of something or uh, by the unexpected semantics of she ate the bed, or they're using more working memory. 
And so here we, we believe that we're the first people to use EEG for a psycholinguistic study uh, in the field, or at least we haven't found other published studies of this. And, and the reason for this is really because of the technology. So we use this headset that has just 14 electrodes and we got 45 adult participants in Toit village in Papua New Guinea in the Nguyen speaking area to participate. And we played them hundreds of Nguyen clause chains, some of which had been altered for three types of switch reference violation. And we're looking for those jolts in brain electrical activity that say, oh, that didn't sound the way it should. Now, this technology is new and rapidly evolving and our use of these reduced uh, electrode headsets meant that we can't look for all of the uh, interesting ERPs that we'd like to. We're hoping to just look for find N400s at the moment. So I'm going to conclude here and I'll try to address this question of whether we can pull results from processing from acquisition to bear on our ongoing typological analysis. Why clause chains are special. This is the typology, the skeletal typology so far. We know that there's an unusual syntactic relationship between clauses, that clause chains indicate through morphology, this multi-clause unit of which there may not be an equivalent in other languages. Is it a sentence? Is it a paragraph following Longacre? There's this inflection for tense in other categories for the clause chains with the, with the, full, with the tense at the end, not at the beginning, which is most of them. This happens only in the very last clause. So there's the potential for ambiguity earlier. And then we have switch reference marking, which forces speakers to commit in advance to the identity of the subject of their next clause, which could follow a significant pause or somebody else repeating their speech. They must commit, but then they must also follow through and remember what they said they were going to say. Clause chains can be extremely long, magnifying some of these potential challenges. And clause chain's most basic semantic function across languages seems to be to describe sequences of related events, states, and actions. So hence, distribution of this unit, this multi-clause unit, can be partially predicted based on discourse organization, unlike coordination and subordination in English and other languages like it. Now, our work on acquisition yielded uh, a major finding that there's this potentially universal two-clause phase no one thought to look into it, it seems, followed by a more clauses phase. And this drastic difference in the trajectories of clause chain production frequencies and those of other complex sentences for the new one speaking children seems to point to a single cognitive constraint on all complex sentence production up to a certain point. But then once that constraint has been lessened or removed, then there's exponential growth in the numbers of clause chains and much slower growth in the numbers of coordinate and subordinate structures. It remains to be seen whether this holds for other clause chaining languages. So what can acquisition of clause chains potentially tell us about typology, about how clause chains differ or are similar across languages? Remember that there was that outstanding question how can we distinguish between clause chaining languages like Nguyen and Japanese and non clause chaining languages like English and Portuguese? What are some hard and fast criteria that we can apply to say, well, yes, you can approximate a clause chain in English and in Portuguese and in these other languages, but nevertheless, English is not a clause chaining language. What criteria can we apply? Well, one of the comparative, one of the papers that we included in our collection for comparative purposes may hold part of the answer. Now, Berman and Lustigman looked at the acquisition and development of verb predicate chaining in modern Hebrew. And they found that indeed in modern Hebrew, you can produce strings of non-finite clauses, clauses with, that are underspecified for tense, combined with a single clause that has full tense specification. But the difference with all the languages that we saw previous, those six clause chaining languages, is in the timing of acquisition and of course, ramifications for frequency in adult speech. In modern Hebrew, these strings are not produced by children. They're acquired late in adolescence or early adulthood, if at all, and their use is restricted to highly literate conversation. So this contrasts with that robust clause chain production by small children acquiring Japanese, Korean, Kuwaru, Nguyen, Pichyan, and Turkish. 
So could we expand our, even our very notion of typology to include another dimension? And this draws on something that I actually heard Ruth Berman say in a presentation in uh, 2016, which is there, there may be something about those elements of language that are present from the beginning, she said. Could this tell us something about not just how children learn language, but about the language itself? Could we do typology sort of inside out or add another multi add another dimension to it and say something like clause chaining languages for if for language to be a clause chaining language, children learning it must produce clause chains by about three years. I leave this as an open question. What else can the acquisition work that we did tell us about typology? Well, there's there are other benefits to doing the acquisition work. And, uh, for these longitudinal language acquisition studies, and even for the ones that are cross-sectional in our corpus, there's a huge amount of language data amassed. And the very large corpora that are amassed to answer questions about acquisition can tell us a lot about typology, frequency, and usage of clause chains for both children and adults. For instance, we found by looking at the Kuwaru clause chain acquisition study, where uh, the authors studied 40 hours of recorded and transcribed speech, speech with 32,860 utterances. This showed us very clearly that although Kuwaru medial verbs obligatory bear switch reference markers, over 97% of Kuwaru adult clause chains and even, even greater proportions of child clause chains involve only subject maintenance or same subject across clauses. And it wasn't widely uh, known previously that in some languages with obligatory switch reference marking on medial verbs like kuwaru, when people talk, they could not use different subject marking. That most of their clause chains would, would be same subject regardless of their uh, morphology that allows them to use different subjects. This could be preferred. This was not known. And these large language corpora, these large speech corpora can uh, give us many insights like this into how people actually talk. Now for processing, the eye tracking study results so far imply that listeners use new one switch reference markers as clues to the identity of the actor in the upcoming clause. Now, can we apply this insight, this insight back to typology? Well, uh, perhaps. At the moment, the best application seems to be simply in disproving, at least for new one, in which this experiment was conducted, any theoretical notions that come up from time to time about whether switch reference markers across all languages actually function to track something other than grammatical subjects. Sometimes this is said with, with grounding in a particular language as with Methuen 1993, or sometimes it's proposed by a theoretician um, on the basis of the occasional mistake or disfluency in uh, clause chain production in a corpus that they've been studying. So in sum, I've given you a lot of information about clause chains, their acquisition, and a bit of an insight into ongoing work into their processing. And I hope that this has, uh, this has shown that an ongoing typological investigation of an under-investigated linguistic category can potentially be fruitfully augmented while typology is still not finalized and cemented. Typological research can be fruitfully augmented by research into acquisition and processing. And I'd like to thank New One Speaking Children and Families, adult storytellers and study participants, the New One research team members who organize the experiments and also do transcription, collaborators on the analyses and uh, experiments here, funders, and finally, ethics approvals. Thank you very much. Hannah, thanks so much. So now it's time for questions. And uh, uh, let me see uh, if we questions we have. Yes, we have a uh, thanks. And uh, uh, just a couple, a few questions. One question is coming up. Uh, how does, you mentioned uh, in some of your uh, early examples, that uh, the uh, actual uh, number and uh, maybe length of closed chains in Newman uh, correlates with speed genre. Could you elaborate on that? 
there was an example um, in the uh, someone from chat is reminding me from grade three and then from grade eight. So uh, could you elaborate on correlation with this course, John? Uh -huh, Thank you. I'm you. Good. Thank yes. you. So th those those two examples um, are uh, served mostly to provide visuals so that you can see what this difference could look like. This difference in the, the sentence types that occur in the essay versus the sentence types that occur in the narrative. However, uh, those examples, one can't directly compare necessarily because they come from children of different ages. So one can't say that um, all narratives of people speaking new one from any, in, at, at any age based on those two examples um, will include that sort of distribution of clause change. And we can't necessarily say that uh, thematically organized discourse of, this, of the sort that we saw in the essay will never include clause chains. But this distinction does hold when you look at adult speech that I didn't show. Um, so when we take new one uh, self introductions, for instance, when people would record themselves talking about their family lineages and uh, reciting people's names and relationships to each other, that generally uses very few clause chains. And it tends to use, in fact, a lot of verbless, equational verbless clauses. So I am X with no verb, because there's no copula in one. Um, so, and when people do produce oral thematic discourse, so I asked several people to record their opinions about the Nuon language as well, not just write it. It's similar to that written example, though there are some clause chains, there's many fewer and much less consistent distribution throughout the text, uh, which is another feature of narratives. Um, in, in those than in narratives. Now, that consistent distribution throughout a text in narratives is quite striking. And I didn't show you an image of this, but I do have charts where I've charted where clause chains occur within a narrative. And this is kind of inspired by, by Labov and others following him. Is, is there a particular part of the text where uh, the, the clause chains occur or not? And in fact, it is, um, it is not the case that there's a particular part of the uh, clause chain, of, of the narrative in which clause chains occur. Um, they occur very consistently throughout these narratives. In all parts of the narratives, there's clause chaining, and you can't say that they only occur at the apex or at the conclusion or at the beginning or that sort of thing. Um, and this is not the case for thematic discourse, which has a very different structure. But I do want to say that um, for some languages, for instance, for Pitya and Yara in our, uh, in our body of child acquisition work, uh, the author says that in fact clause chains are not as frequent and not as long in Pitya and Yara everyday discourse that she recorded as they are in narratives. And this is something that has also been described for other languages. And for new one, I don't see indication that that's necessarily the case. Um, so for instance, you saw a text message, it's not a narrative, um, it's a transactional interaction um, asking me a question about whether something could happen. Um, this already is a five clause chain. So there's no restriction on, if, if people want to talk about sequences of related events, actions, and states that occur somehow sequentially to each other, then they'll use a clause chain in any discourse genre. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, there is a message, there are two questions from Aza Bamha. She is saying, thanks Hannah for this very interesting talk. Uh, a question, number one, is there a formal distinction in Nungan between medial clauses and other dependent clauses, such as adverbal temporal clauses? And once you answer that, I will, I will ask the second question, uh, Azeb. Okay. Um, first, yes, there is a distinction in Nungan between, so medial verbs, regardless of whether they're marked for same subject or different subject, all end in what I call medial verb suffix ah. And this is different from other dependent verb forms. So the verbs that occur in tight multi-verb predicates um, or nominalized verbs or uh, what I call participles. So there are a number of other dependent verb forms in Nuon that don't serve as the predicates of medial clauses. And medial clauses, me medial verbs are differentiated from those verb types. But um, in Nuon, it happens that some of the clause types that that you're just that you're suggesting so adverbial or temporal um in new one the, the the strategy for expressing that type of meaning is often with a clause chain so i would argue that the function of medial clauses is is quite broad 
and may extend to some of these other functions. Second question from Azeb. Thanks, Hanna. Thanks for this. Uh, is the as follows within a single clause chain do we get combinations of middle clauses and other types of dependent clauses and if so how does that affect which reference yeah that's that's a very good question um i so in general no but yes it does happen so overall it's uh i would say it's in the vast minority of cases when you have um uh, subordinate final clauses, and these are generally marked with this kind of all-purpose subordinator ma, you can have those um, interspersed in a clause chain for some speakers more than others um, with medial clauses, but it's very rare. And, in, and this is a, a place where nuon discourse seems to diverge from uh, languages like Turkish, where this is much more prominent, this sort of uh, combination within a clause chain. And it's a challenge for the typology as to how we interpret it. In new one, this, this happens very infrequently. And generally, um, these can be understood as, um, as sort of uh, explanatory. They are backgrounded relative in, in Hopper's term a lot, relative to the ongoing main event line of the clause chain. And they don't seem to affect switch reference marking. So even if they're technically outside of a clause boundary, um, this marker, which is the same marker that you saw in that relative clause earlier on, this marker seems to set these apart from the main event line of the clause chain. Thank you. Now, a question from Bob Dixon, who actually is here, but he can't fit onto the screen, and also best wishes from Bob Dixon. He would like to ask uh, about a potential relative tense inflection on medial clauses. Because in many languages, medial clauses can also mark a simultaneous or subsequent event or preceding event. There are some languages in New Guinea, like Emile, that appear to mark irrealis of all things on medial clauses. How does it work in the languages you looked at, including Nungan? And is there any other any tendencies in how children acquire uh, such relationship uh, type things in? Uh, uh, clauses in within sentences. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, so starting with the, sequ the sequential or simultaneous distinctions, so that doesn't occur in Nguyen, but it does occur in, in Kuwaru. Um, and what, what we found was that generally across these languages, this is a generalization, but so, well, and this goes all the way up to Korean, where there are a hundred, one hundred different uh, medial verb suffixes that have slightly different semantic uh, semantic effects that can be used on medial verbs in Korean. So 100 that people have to choose from. Of course, a, a much smaller group of these, about 12, actually occur in, in the child caregiver speech generally. But so what we found is that in general, it does hold that the earliest relationships that we see are simultaneous and sequential, um, and that there isn't necessarily a progression from sequential to simultaneous, although that, that um, I think that was the case maybe for one or two languages, it's in our paper. Um, but that beyond that, the other um, relationships that are more nuanced in languages like Korean, such as uh, causation, um, all of these other uh, nuances come up later. Um, so really, it, the, what I'm considering in this skeletal typology so far, the basic underlying semantics of clause chains across languages, this sequentiality, which has the potential for simultaneity, of course, uh, simultaneity. Um, I'm considering that kind of a basic across languages and that does seem to be the sim sim simultaneous and sequential function seems to be the first that children acquire in these languages mm -hmm. and they later expand to causation and other things. Thank you. Thank you. And here is another question just come up. Uh, so switch reference is taken as a clue to upcoming subject identity, yet there is a certain body of literature which started by Herr Racing's article in 1983, uh, dealing with the fact that sometimes you get uh, a switch, you get same subject when in actual fact it is same topic. So would you be able to comment on such examples and also examples that occur in Andy Pauli's work on things like hunger hurts to me uh, when you uh, have a sort of non uh, hunger hurts to me, same subject, I do something or other, and yet hunger is the subject. So is there any account uh, or is it too early to ask for? Uh, yeah, this, 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 so this is a great point. And this is, 
I think that the one of the problems to me, um, when I, I come from, of course, the, the perspective of new one, where switch reference very strictly follows grammatical subject. So for instance, we saw that the question triggers switch reference marking. Um, when people use these constructions from Polly, et cetera, so um, uh, my body is heavy, meaning I was tired, there's switch reference marking because body is different from me. So body is grammatically different from me, even though it pertains to me. So from my new one corpus in general, my grammar in general, um, I can assert that this is the case for new one. Now in our, I mean, the, the challenge, and hopefully we can do follow up and follow up and follow up studies of this and continue to hone our understanding of the psycholinguistics of it. Um, this is challenging to represent visually on the screen and be able to say with with um, certainty whether a person is tracking a topic or whether they're tracking a subject. So all we can say right now is what the experiment tells us based on the images. So we can't get down to that uh, fine degree of detail. And I'm not sure that we'll be able to use a visual worlds paradigm with a picture of a person to separate between that person and their body. That just may be impossible with this sort of paradigm and we'll have to get at this some other way. But yes, so that, that, that is definitely um, down the line. Once we've, uh, if, if we get satisfactory results from this iteration, then we'd like to do other iterations. Thank you. And I just got another message, uh, well, through my mobile phone, because not everyone can access the internet. Uh, can, uh, given that we have such wild differences between switch reference and it's used in Pitan Jajara, Turkish and Nungan, and other Papua New Guinea languages, would you consider a uh, possibility of considering switch close chaining a sort of grad uh, gradient category? So you have more uh, like a stronger uh, sw switch uh, reference or close chaining in some languages, weaker one in others? Yes, certainly. Makes sense. Yeah, so, so, so certainly there's some sort of spectrum um, and part of, Part of the, as I would say, all hands on deck. So part of part of the uh, the um, part of the reason for doing acquisition and processing and typological work simultaneously is to try to get at some of these questions that are um, that really deal with 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 a spectrum. They really deal with a gradient, um, and they may deal with. Uh, nuances of frequencies, nuances of genre. There's, there, there's a lot of things that we still have to pick apart here. And definitely we, we've, um, our investigations, especially into acquisition, have brought to light other minute differences between languages. So for instance, Kuaru and Nuan, these two languages of Papua New Guinea don't just differ in the ways that I mentioned in the talk. But beyond this, Nuan in general seems to have the possibility for much longer clause chains in everyday discourse than Kuaru. How do we uh, uh, place those on this spectrum? Where do we place them on, on, the, on the plane of clause chaining and switch reference marking remains to be seen. Yes, uh, it looks like uh, people are still thinking about other questions and presumably they'll be able to contact you if they have any questions. And there is a big thank you from Azabamha here on chat and various other people, including Bob Dixon and uh, I would also like uh, to, to thank you again on behalf of Abraline and linguistics in general. It's really a groundbreaking presentation, like all your work, basically. Uh, would you, uh, and also I would like to, uh, every, uh, to invite everyone to continue communicating with you about uh, the issues of uh, language acquisition and acquisition of close chaining and of course to continue watching this series because it's all incredibly important. Hanna, would you like to conclude uh, your talk with some final remarks or maybe some sort of ideas that people can follow uh, in your footsteps as it were? Well, my as, as, a, as a field worker speaking to other field workers, I'd like to encourage everyone to Continue to bang on the doors of your colleagues um, who are psycholinguists, bang on the doors of your colleagues who are acquisition people, and make them aware of all of the interesting things, the things that you, uh, that you find fascinating about the, the particularities of the work that you do on languages. Sit with them, uh, explain to them, 
And let's see what other interesting collaborations we can in, in kind of across sub-disciplines collaborations that we can come up with. Thanks very much. And thanks to Abraline. Yeah, thanks so much. So this finished, but our conversation will still continue. And please, please watch this series. Thanks so much. See you all. Thank you. Thank you.